Hello there friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. In 2015, NASA, the agency best known by the internet community for its noble attempts to prevent the rest of us stupid humans from falling off the ice wall at the edges of Discworld, conducted a study known as the One Year Mission. This is a very unique experiment that was designed to look at the long-term effects that spaceflight could have on the human body. The conclusions of this study are becoming increasingly relevant thanks to a new renaissance in spaceflight technology due to several amazing public-slash-private partnerships between NASA and companies like SpaceX. As I'm writing this, Boeing and Lockheed Martin's joint venture United Launch Alliance has just sent their Vulcan rocket towards the moon. On top of the Vulcan rocket is Pittsburgh-based Astrobotic Technologies Lunar Lander. Unfortunately, this lunar lander suffered a critical loss in propellant, which means that while it will still land on the moon, it probably will be coming in too quick. Nonetheless, this is a sign of things to come. Hopefully after this first commercial flight to the moon is successful, after another attempt, we'll have another manned mission to the moon. That is, if you believe in the moon. And eventually, humanity will finally leave our flat Earth and venture to nearby Mars and beyond. In order for these missions to happen, though, we'll need to fully understand the consequences of long-term space travel on the human body. Now, one method used in observational studies is establishing a baseline that is different from whatever effect you're trying to study. For instance, if you're trying to figure out the long-term health effects associated with working in the firing chamber of the Death Star Super Laser, you would establish a baseline by examining the health of a group of people who aren't working on the Death Star, and then compare their health to the poor weapons officers that are being exposed to what I imagine are lethal doses of gamma radiation on the wreck. I imagine you'll find that these weapons officers will have a higher rate of cancer and just DNA damage. Now, there is a problem though, because your baseline group might also have some outliers that have genetic or environmental factors that also give them cancer and damage DNA. Ideally, if you draw from a larger sample size, your control group will have less inaccuracies. But say you had identical twins who have the same exact genomes. Suddenly, you can remove all the genetic factors that might affect the outcome of your study, and you could possibly even remove a lot of the environmental differences because these twins are most likely raised together. As a result, you'll have a much clearer baseline for whatever experiment you're trying to run. And that's why NASA's one-year mission is so unique. You see, they enlisted the help of the Kelly brothers. Scott and Mark are identical twins, and while Scott spent an entire year in low Earth orbit aboard the ISS, Mark Kelly remained on Earth. Everything they did was monitored closely, and the study found out a lot of important things, like that the immune system doesn't greatly change in space. Scott and Mark were both given a flu vaccine and their bodies function very similarly. It was also found that the human body is quite resilient. And although there were some differences in Scott's DNA, once he returned, his gene expression levels mostly went back to baseline. There were, however, some minor changes in his DNA, and now Scott perhaps is no longer 100% identical to Mark. Twin studies have been around for quite some time. The Greek physician Hippocrates first studied twins in the 5th century BC. In the 18th century, Carl Gustav, the third king of Sweden, not the anti-tank rifle, commissioned the first medical study using identical twins. He basically pardoned these identical twins from death row, and then forced one to drink tea for the rest of his life and the other one to drink coffee for the rest of his life. Gustav III wanted to prove that tea and coffee had a detrimental effect on human health. Yeah, rich people problems. Unfortunately, he was assassinated long before the study was finished. And apparently like the tea drinking identical twin died first at 83. I don't know if that means anything. Now, one of the more controversial aspects of twin studies involves the idea of nurture versus nature. In many ways, the holy grail of twin studies is this idea of separating identical twins at birth and giving them completely different upbringings and seeing how much that affects their development into adulthood. You could say give one twin to a wealthy, highly educated royal family on Alderaan, and you can give the other twin to moisture farmers on Tatooine. Then, when they're older, you can see who tests higher on IQ scores or has higher midichlorian counts. Of course, Luke and Leia were fraternal twins, and so they only shared about 50% of their DNA. Also, their separation was rarely necessary because it made it much harder for their father, Darth Vader, to find them or something like that. What would not be ethical by today's medical standards would be to just separate twins at birth for scientific reasons. And that's something that the Nazis did quite a lot in World War II in their concentration camps. Joseph Engel, the angel of death, carried out all sorts of unnecessary and barbaric twin studies during the war, many of which had no scientific value whatsoever, like the time he injected 14 identical twins' hearts with chloroform, killing them, or in his various studies with uh, sewing twins together to try to create conjoined human beings. The guy was a complete fucking psychopath. Now, in the Star Wars universe, the rules and ethics are quite different. For instance, cloning of basically any species is not only allowed, but widely used as cheap labor. I guess it's better than slavery because you're creating your own slaves property? I don't know. 
The Kaminoans were amongst the best cloners in the galaxy, having genetically engineered their own race in order to survive cataclysmic floods that engulfed their entire world. Yes, they made themselves into dolphin kin, which is really suspect. Should not trust these guys whatsoever. But anyway, they took this knowledge and made a very profitable enterprise making custom batches of clones for various business interests. Their specialty included altering the donor DNA given to them by the clients and specifically tailoring it to their needs. In the case of the clone army, Django Fett, the bounty hunter's DNA, was used because of his physical health, athleticism, vigor, fearlessness, and aggression. But at the same time, the Kaminoans were instructed to make obedient soldiers that were good at following orders, something that Django Fett just wasn't able to do. The man was a lone wolf or a leader, he was never a follower. Through quite a lot of trial and error, what resulted was perhaps one of the most well-balanced soldiers the galaxy has ever seen. The average clone trooper was an exceptionally capable and well-trained individual who was mentally very balanced and focused on the task at hand. They were smart, deadly, but also loyal and obedient. I mean, without even trying, there are many great examples of twin studies emerging out of the clone army. Just by understanding the lore, you can find all sorts of interesting things. For instance, in Legends, if you take a look at clone commando units, they were separated into small squads of four. These squads would train together and eventually fight together. Their trainers were personally selected by Django Fett, and they were known as the Kulvaldar. There were a hundred of them, and 75 of them were actually Mandalorian. The Kul Valdar were more than just trainers, though many of these individuals took on a more parental role when guiding their commandos. Simply because this training happened at a very young age, and you know, it doesn't matter how big and tough you are when you see a bunch of essentially five-year-olds, six-year-olds, you want to nurture them. Especially the Mandalorians, whose whole society was founded on, you know, bringing war to planets and then, like, rescuing the orphans and adopting them. Individuals like Jango Fett and Tinjarin were both found on battlefields by Mandalorians and adopted directly as foundlings afterwards. It was later found out that the casualty rate of clone commander units trained by Mandalorians was far lower than other clone commander units that were trained by non-Mandalorians. And this wasn't just because of the tactical and strategic knowledge that Mandalorian trainers had, it was also this warrior culture that the Mandalorians had imparted to their soldiers. These clone commandos spoke Mandalorian and they considered themselves Mandalorian. And I think that identity really shaped uh, how they were on the battlefield and made them much tougher and harder to kill. They also watched each other's back like they were you know, brothers. Another interesting study would be to look at hair loss in clone troopers and find out what kind of jobs or units have higher rates of balding clones. Is it the ATTE drivers or the gunship pilots? Is it the heavy weapons specialists? You basically have already eliminated the genetic factors of hair loss here and now you can just look at like stress and diet and other things. Perhaps equally as interesting is the psychology of various clones. When Order 66 occurs and the Empire transitions to the New Order, we do see some clones resisting and rebelling their new masters. You have individuals like Captain Halza, who was stationed on Ryloth after the Clone Wars ended. He was a compassionate and thoughtful clone who tried to balance the security needs of his people with the respect he believed the Ryloth people deserved. Captain Hauser had fought with the Twi'leks during the Clone Wars and had earned the respect of Resistance leader Cham Sandula. When the Empire made their presence on the planet permanent and began establishing Dooney and refinery mines on the world and enslaving Twi'leks, the Twi'lek people began to protest against Imperial occupation. Eventually, Captain Hauser was made to choose between the Twi'lek people and his duty as a commanding officer in the Imperial Army. He would choose to protect the Twi'lek people and would get arrested as a result. What made Captain Hauser rebel? I'm sure Palpatine would want to know. Was it his close relationship with Cham Samdula and the Twi'lek Resistance? Was he just raised properly by the right trainers? Did he perhaps serve beneath the Jedi Commander at some point in his life that surely would have altered his trajectory in life and shaped his personality and views? For example, if you have a Jedi Commander like Pong Krell, well, first, you're probably not going to survive for very long. And should you survive, you'll be a hardened individual. You'll understand that your commanders don't really value you and your brother's lives, and you'll survive many harrowing frontal attacks and suicide missions. This makes a person into a survivor, and that means focusing more on themselves and being more cynical about the world. A clone who has served beneath Pong Krell is far more likely to enjoy Order 66. Heck, they might not even need an inhibitor chip to give them a reason to shoot a Jedi in the back. The same thing goes for the clones who served beneath Quinlan Vos. That guy also really hated clones. But then, what about the clones who had the chance to serve beneath Grandmaster Yoda? He imparted many wise lessons to the clones that he fought with, treated them like younglings and Padawans he did. What about the clones who served beneath General Obi-Wan Kenobi, one of the best defensive duelists in the Order and a very meticulous and careful strategist 
strategist and military leader. Commander Cody, his XO, is also very serious and calculating as a result. He's also an outside-the-box thinker, just like his Jedi General. Commander Cody would make friends with more unorthodox clone units like Clone Force 99. A lot of regular clones who have not been taught the values of a Jedi Knight saw the Clone Force 99 as freaks and disregarded them very foolishly. It's no surprise that Clone Commando Cody would eventually leave the Empire, although he was initially duped, the lessons Obi-Wan Kenobi taught him ultimately made him understand the difference between right and wrong. Perhaps the most interesting unit we can look at in the JAR when it comes to this nurture versus uh, nature discussion would be Anakin Skywalker's 501st Legion. Anakin Skywalker and his apprentice Ahsoka Tano were unorthodox Jedi. They generally didn't follow procedures or the rules, especially if they were in a rush. They're also very headstrong and brash individuals, and they encouraged their clone troopers to develop their own identities and follow in their lead. This is probably why the 501st is one of the most tatted up units in the JAR, and it wasn't just a physical appearance thing. Many of the 501st clones were extremely headstrong and generally very individualistic. I mean, take a look at Fives. When his brother Tup's control chip malfunctioned during the Battle of Ringo Vinda, Fives took the initiative and carried out his own independent investigation against the orders of his superiors. He managed to uncover a conspiracy to implant these control chips into the clone's brains with the stated purpose of killing all of the Jedi. And he actually manages to do all of this on his own and he even passes on this information to Captain Rex and Anakin before he's killed. The two don't really believe him at first, but Captain Rex later on during Order 66 remembers his important lesson and manages to delay the effect of the chip long enough for Ahsoka Tano to escape. I would go as far to say that generally most clones that have a good relationship with their Jedi leaders develop more individuality and more balanced personalities. It makes sense that having a positive role model and caring leader can lead to better outcomes. In our own world, the idea of using clones for you know twin studies is not only very far-fetched, there's a lot of ethical problems with that approach. I remember when I was a kid reading a story in Time for Kids about Dolly the Sheep, the first cloned large mammal. She was born out of soul and immediately became cannibalistic. I'm just joking. She was a normal sheep, more or less. But the excitement of cloning died within a few years, especially after it was realized that no one really wanted to clone human beings. There was an ethical boundary that people did not want to cross. It was actually probably this scientific achievement, the cloning of Dolly, that actually inspired George Lucas to create the clone army just a few years later with the prequel series. At the time, cloning was really hot technology. There was also that movie called The Island with Obi-Wan Kenobi and Black Widow, in which rich people were growing their clones so that they had replacement organs, blood, and tissue that they could harvest in case there were some medical issues with them. The problem with doing this is when you create a sentient being, that sentient being deserves to have all the rights the rest of us do. This means autonomy and independence, but if you are in fact creating this individual in a lab and then you're experimenting on them, you're kind of removing all of those rights that they might have. Which is also why the Clone Wars is perhaps one of the most messed up aspects of Star Wars. So there you have it guys, that is our video for today. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. As usual, my name is Alan, reminding you that my allegiance is to the Republic, to democracy. I'll see you next time.